UK Chief Transition and Financial Officer. For the duration of the call, you will be in listen-only mode. However, at the end of the call, you will have the opportunity to ask questions. Should anyone need assistance during the conference call, they may signal an operator by pressing star and zero on their telephone. I'm now handing you over to your hosts to begin today's conference. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to UNI third quarter nine month 2024 results conference call. Energy markets continue to be volatile and unpredictable, driven by a mixture of fundamentals, geopolitics and speculative trading flows. Our focus is on maintaining resilient and competitive operating and financial performance, reinforcing our balance sheet while funding both investment into the business and attractive distribution to shareholders, and progressing our strategy. In the third quarter, we clearly continue to deliver on all those objectives. In Q3, we did report resilient results with pro forma adjusted EBIT of 3.4 billion euro and cash flow from operation of 2.9 billion euro, despite the deterioration in scenario across most of our main businesses. We also lowered debt and leverage well ahead of our original plan. I will speak in more detail on our results shortly. Let me focus on strategic activity. We are executing at pace around a clearly defined portfolio of businesses. Those businesses are both transition-oriented and where ENI has clear competitive advantages and where we can generate competitive growth and returns. Starting with the transition satellites and their lives specifically, we are delighted to have confirmed the investment by KKR into AnyLive. The 2.9 billion investment for a 25% stake supports our growth and confirms the value already created. Similar to our plan to transaction, transaction earlier this year, it assesses a new pool of aligned capital, more appropriate for the different growth and risk profile of this business. Furthermore, the growth is clear. In Q3, we sanctioned two biorefineries, South Korea and Malaysia, and confirm that the construction work at Livorno will begun, begin sun, soon, and we will start our first biojet plant in Jela at the end of this year. Upstream continues to be an area of significant distinctiveness and competitive advantage. In August, we began gas production at Argo Cassiopeia of Shore Sicily. Production at zero on scope one and two, will quickly ramp up into the winter, contributing to gas supply for Italy. Joan Casper and Balain Phase 2 will start up before the end of the year, contributing to reach our production targets. Also in August, and only 10 months after the discovery of Gang North, Indonesia authorities approved our plan of development of the Northern Up in the Kutei Basin, as well as significant extension to the plateau at our Southern Up centered around the existing Jan Creek FPU. Together, these two hubs will account for over 400,000 barrels per day, and the NS equity is over 80%. Additionally, we have identified over 30 TCF for near field exploration potential, offering potentially very material upside. The scale of this opportunity underpins our growth potential beyond the end of the current four year plan, and of course, offers the opportunity for some early monetization via, via our proven dual exploration model. While Planet and Live are currently our main transition satellites, Q3 also saw an important milestone in the development of a new one, CCUS. First CO2 injection began at our Ravenna project here in Italy. This is the first plant able to capture more than 90% of the CO2 emitted by our upstream plants. At the same time, we secure the key milestone of agreed government funding on our INET CCS project in the UK. As a reminder, we are looking to build over 50 million tonne of capacity before 2030 and grow that to over 40 million tonne in, in the 2030s and it is an ideal vehicle for a tailored satellite structure. Turning now to our Q3 results in more detail, we reported pro forma adjusted debit of 3.4 billion euro, euro and cash flow from operation of 2.9 billion both down just 14% year on year, despite a deterioration in the scenario. Our upstream business were the standout contribution to our results this quarter. 
our satellites and associates made up over one third of our EBIT. Finance expense remains low even before debts begin to fall materially, while the tax rate of 51 percent was consistent with this quarter's oil price and earning mix. Cash flow from operation for the quarter was 2.9 billion euro, giving 10.7 billion euro for the nine months, a consistent conversion of profits into cash. This has served to cover a working capital build, CAPEX, net m a the dividend, and a portion of the buyback to date. After the effect of the cash out for Neptune in Q1, net debt has fallen in Q2 and Q3, even with only modest divestment income. We will see an acceleration of this reduction in the coming quarters. CAPEX for the quarter was 2 billion euro, and for the nine months was 6.1 billion euro, minus 10% versus last year. We expect it to be below 9 billion euro for the year, even taking into account the seasonally normal uptick of the first of the last quarter. Net capex was 1.6 billion euro in the quarter and should be below 6 billion, assuming the cash inflow of agreed transaction waiting to close at year end. In global natural resources, EMP contributed 3.2 billion euro of pro forma EBIT with results resilience in the face of lower crude prices and helped by production up 2% year on year. GGP delivered a strong quarter for the summer month, helped by an improving price scenario and hub spreads and confirming a robust results even in an year of limited volatility. In the two key transition businesses, AnyLive delivered strong by refinery throughput growth and excellent utilization. EBIT was hurt by the weak bio scenario, but marketing made a strong contribution. Plenitude is also contributed, continuing along its planet growth trajectory. Year on year EBIT was lower versus 2023, but it will beat our budget results on a yearly basis. Net debt and leverage in the quarter were both down and we remain comfortable below the top end of the plan 15-25% leverage range despite closing only one major, major divestment in the quarter while also stepping up our share buyback and paying a portion of the remaining outstanding extra profit tax balance. But uh, as we discussed a Kuchu, that is not the full story. We have been advancing our portfolio activity faster and for greater value than we anticipated and planned for. Our expectation is that by year end, pro forma leverage will be toward the bottom of that range. Shareholder distribution remain our first priority. In September, we pay the first tranche of the annual one euro dividend plus 6% versus last year. Our buyback in the quarter totaled 560 million euro or 1.3% of shares in issue, which are now down 12% since we restarted the program in 2022. As we reduce shares in issue, this adds further, along with the business performance and the balance sheet strength, to the quality and value of our dividend. With that balance sheet improvement in mind and the continuous success in our portfolio program, we also confirm today an increase in the 2024 share buyback. We now plan to repurchase 2 billion euro in the program, an increase in 400 million, delivering on our raised commitment announced at Q1, and in addition reflecting the better than planned progress in our MA. At today's share price, our distribution yield is 11.5%. Our efforts on growing new transition business has broader implication. It is also an opportunity to build new, highly attractive opportunities around our chemical sector. Fixing the result of this loss-making segment will be a significant contributor to the earnings and cash flow potential we see for ENI going forward and is a real priority for us. Since March, we have been developing a detailed plan, which we now want to take the opportunity to share with you. We also had the opportunity to share this with the unions. Versalis has accumulated material loss over the past years, and this negative trend has continued through 2024. Our response is one of both restructuring and transformation. The future platform of Versalis will have a significantly different profiles, one focused on an high-value downstream portfolio of compounding and specialized polymers, one on biochemistry biochemistry and on circular economy, a portfolio more consistent 
with ENI technology-led strategy focused on competitively advantaged businesses into the transition. This transformation can leverage the resource of a highly skilled workforce, but dedicated it to higher value and more sustainable activities. At Priolo, we are evaluating constructing a biorefinery for SAF and a chemical recyc recycling plant employing our HOOP technology. At Brindisi, we target to continue polymer manufacture by using cost advantage imported raw materials and we will convert a part of the site to the construction of a new factory facilities for the manufacturing of stationary network batteries. In the meantime, we plan to shut down cracking at both Priolo and Brindisi. We will also look to exit or significantly reduce our exposure at Dunkirk. This is a necessary response to the structural disadvantage European basic chemicals manufacturing faces versus other regions. And we will reduce polymer capacity by seizing poly polyethylene production at Ragusa. You will be aware we closed operation at Grangemort earlier this year. Part an initiative to drive efficiency in polymers may, might also be taken. The European chemicals industry has further deteriorated in 2024, and it is not expected to improve in 2025. In this context, our expectation is to move to positive EBIT in 2027 and free cash flow break even in 2028. We are comfortable on the ultimate success of this turnaround as we faced similar issues over a decade ago in our refining operation. The transformation path we, we chose then by refining evolved into any live, with the resulting scale of ensuring value creation we have been able to specifically highlight today. Moving to guidance. For full year upstream production is expected around 1.7 million barrels per day, the middle of the original guidance reflecting the expected impact of OPEC plus quotas. GGP pro forma EBIT is raised again to 1.1 billion euro, while we confirm our transition businesses to deliver EBITDA of 1 billion each. Group pro forma EBIT and cash flow from variation expectation have been reduced from Q2 on the lower scenario assumption, but reflect outperformance versus the original plan of more than 1 billion in each case. We can confirm gross capes below 9 billion euro and net capes well below 6, and I have already discussed the outlook for leverage. And this provides a setting for the raise by back to 2 billion for 1.6 billion and the 1.1 in the original guidance. For the purpose of modeling our cash flow for operation for the fourth quarter, you should assume dividend from associate exceeding net income by around 25% a relationship that also holds for the full year, while the cash tax rate will revert to a more normal level in the low 30s down from Q3. To summarize, Q3 represents a very good quarter amid a volatile and challenging environment. We have significantly advanced strategy, developing growth in advantage of business and securing value. We are addressing underperforming activity with the prospect of materi materially improving financial performance, and we continue to pursue our cost reduction program that has already achieved the 300 million euro of saving that we plan for this year. Our recently announced reorganization reinforced our action in each of these aspects, but critically, our financial performance continues to be highly competitive and resilient. Indeed, we are now positioned in an historically strong situation, financially and strategically, and this is confirmed in our decision to raise our 2024 share buyback. That hence my remarks, and now, together with ENI Top Management, I am ready to answer your questions. Thank you. This is the conference operator. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. To remove yourself from the question queue, please press star and two. Please pick up the receiver when asking questions. Anyone who has a question can press star and one at this time. We will pause for a moment as participants are joining the queue. The first question is from Josh Stone with UBS. Please go ahead. Thanks and uh, good afternoon. Uh, two questions, please. Firstly, on any live and congratulations on getting getting the deal over the line at a still attractive valuation. At the time of the initial agreement, you highlighted the potential to maybe sell another 10% of that business, but you know, given you sold 
the higher end at 25% to KKR. Can you just update us how much of a priority is that for ENI uh, today? Uh, and then second question on the, on the petrochemical restructuring, and, and you provided some helpful slides on that. Thank you. Maybe just, just talk about the path towards profitability from here. How, how soon should we expect to see a benefit from some of these initiatives, in particular closing some of these less competitive crackers and and, and also maybe you know, what was the response from the unions or what has been the response from the unions so far on this? Uh, and is your target uh, still to reach uh, break even EBITDA in, in 2025? Is, is that still valid? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Joshua. I will answer to the to the first question about any live and I will leave the floor to Adriano Alfani for the chemicals. Uh, on uh, on any live, clearly you remember correctly we uh, we had the uh, once we announced that the exclusive agreement for negotiation with KKR uh, that we have the range of 10 uh, well, sorry 20 to 25 percent of disposal and uh, from 5 to 10 percent of the additional potential interest uh, or stake that could be let's say put on uh, put on, uh, on 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 sale. Uh, clearly, having the 25 percent, uh, we are uh, now moving to the lower end, uh, to a lower part of the range of the 5 to 10 percent. So we want to see if clearly there is an opportunity to, let's say, eventually bring another partner with a smaller stake, clearly not the 10 percent, because uh, we will have, uh, let's say, a large uh, disposal uh, of 25 plus an additional 10 percent if we move to the top end of the both uh, of the both uh, options. This is the reason we move. Uh, we think that it is more appropriate to keep uh, the lower uh, the lower percentage as a reference. And now I leave it to Adriano. Thanks, Josh, uh, for for the three questions about um, the chemical piece. Uh, let me start with the first one about the improvement in the result that we expect. To be honest with you, uh, from a market point of view, we don't expect a significant improvement. We still see a, a grim outlook. Um, there is no um, meaningful economic recovery at this time for the 2025 and also for the end of 2024. So the improvements that we expect in the economics of Versailles are mainly coming in this context of scenario from action that we are going to put in place. That means uh, restructuring the base chemical portfolio and on the other side, uh, developing uh, and growing uh, the new platforms that uh, Francesco was referring in his speech. Uh, how fast the improvement will come, clearly, gradually, and depending on the speed that we are going to execute all the intervention from a restructuring point of view. Uh, that uh, we see over the next uh, four or five years uh, gradually improving. Of course, uh, an improvement in the scenario in terms of possible recovery will help in order to have a bolster in uh, execution plan. But at this moment, uh, we would like to be a little more, uh, let's say, the catalytic in the outlook from demand point of view for the reason that I was explaining uh, based on uh, some developing in the market, automotive sector in Europe, uh, construction and so on. In terms of response from union, uh, every time that, of course, you present an aggressive plan, this was a pretty aggressive plan in terms of restructuring, uh, there are many questions. Fundamentally, um, they understand that uh, the time for the base chemical uh, situation in Europe uh, is extremely challenging. And, of course, uh, the company cannot continue in uh, losing uh, cash. And so something must be done. And so they are fundamentally onboarding in order to do many different action in order to improve and to create the sustainability for the future, not only in terms of economic sustainability, but also in terms of, uh, of course, the people sustainability in terms of uh, employment and so on. From an EBITDA point of view, that is the third question for 2025 at this moment, uh, it is unlikely that we can be break even a be done in 2025 in this context of a scenario. But of course, in case of improvement, uh, I mean, we can, uh, we can target in order to be significantly better than in 2024 in uh, the performance of EBITDA for 2025. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Alessandro Pozzi, Medio Banca. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for taking uh, my questions. Um, I have two. 
Um, the first one is on uh, uh, disposals. So three year, uh, this year we have three billion of uh, of cash in. Um, you've done um, you've announced a lot of transactions, uh, um, but based on what we read in the press, there's uh, a lot more that potentially is going to come through um, in uh, maybe in 2025. And I was wondering if you can help us to understand how much of the cash in could be uh, next year um, if we use again a uh, few billion. Is it uh, a, a good assumption? Those if you can maybe give us uh, a bit more color on. Uh, uh, on what you have uh, maybe at the moment, um, the, the opportunities that are more mature compared to others in, in terms of disposals, if you can. Um, the second question is on uh, Indonesia. Uh, uh, you, you mentioned in the opening remarks uh, that you received approval from new development plans. Um, and I was wondering what sort of activities we could see in Indonesia next year. You mentioned 400,000 barrels potentially could be achieved by the end of the plan. Uh, I was wondering what is the, the shape of uh, the production growth that we could see from Indonesia uh, in the next few years. Thank you. Okay, I will answer to the first question about the disposal and then I will leave uh, the uh, answer to Guido Brusco for the Indonesia activity. About on disposal, you know that we have a net uh, uh, M&A uh, cash in expected in this uh, in 2024, or 3.6, we raise versus the original assumption. Uh, clearly, this includes uh, not only the cash in coming from uh, the disposal, but also the cash out uh, that was uh, mainly concentrated at the beginning of the year once uh, we paid the acquisition uh, of Neptune and a smaller acquisition in the renewable segment. Uh, for next year, uh, the expectation is to have additional disposal that are uh, maturing, uh, and these are uh, the origin uh, of the expectation we have, uh, we have on the leverage performa, and uh, the range of cash-in that we can expect next year uh, is around the 2.5 billion uh, euros. So these are the two figures uh, you have to keep in mind. This is clearly coming from the disposal. There could be some smaller uh, additional disposal and acquisition that uh, we consider, uh, let's say, uh, covering or uh, offsetting each other. And now I leave to, to Guido uh, the, the second answer. And so thank you. First of all, thank you for the question. And um, let, me, let me start with uh, providing some more background on the scale of, uh, of the asset in, uh, in Indonesia. So uh, first of all, um, this year we've completed uh, our evaluation of the discovery of Gang North that uh, is confirming uh, a potential of a 5 TCF of, uh, of gas. And of course, the scale of this this discovery is creating uh, a critical mass also for the development of uh, uh, some resources uh, discovered and, uh, and acquired as a part of the transaction we did last year with, uh, with Chevron. Uh, the, discovery, uh, the discovered resources of uh, that transaction accounts for uh, uh, a number close to another five TCF, which of course will be um, uh, complementing uh, the Gang North, uh, the Gang North the discovery. So, if we uh, consider both the plan of development for the uh, North Hub, which is Gang North and those discoveries, plus the um, uh, additional uh, resources that we'll bring in into the South Hub. Uh, we envisage a combined production uh, at regime of over then 400,000 barrel of oil equivalent per day, which is uh, give and take two BCF of gas and 80,000 uh, barrel of, uh, uh, of condensate. On top of that, we have an exploration potential, which we estimated in, in a region of, uh, of course, unrisked, uh, of 30 TCF of gas, which we have significantly risked uh, by the nearby uh, discoveries. Um, Clearly, the, the discovery of Gang Nord uh, have allowed a, a more detailed reconstruction of the geological uh, model, and, uh, and now we, we think that uh, uh, this potential is, um, is um, uh, well and better and, uh, and risks. And so we are targeting also uh, quite a significant number of exploration wells in the basin in the next, uh, in the next, four, in the next four years. So, uh, 
that's in a, in a nutshell what will look like the uh, Indonesia asset in the forthcoming years. To, to come to your question, um, and, and of course we can leverage on uh, the existing uh, facilities and the excess capacity of uh, the uh, liquefaction plant of Bontang, uh, which is nearby, and uh, um, which, which uh, uh, has a total capacity of more than 20 million tons per annum, with only three train operational of uh, uh, 10 uh, million uh, tons per annum and a, a utilization of less than 60% uh, last, last year. So we can clearly leverage on, on that. And as you, as you know, we are in a premium market. To come to your question, which is the activity we are, uh, we are doing, uh, we, we are now in the, in the front-end engineering design uh, of the, um, of the uh, facilities. Uh, we are also uh, starting, we have already started the drilling activity in August to develop uh, um, some uh, fields discovered close to the uh, South Hub, namely Marrakesh East. And, uh, and the rig, of course, will continue the activity in the, in the south uh, up in, in, in 2025 and 2026, uh, 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 while we um, will take uh, uh, very likely by the end of the year or beginning of the next an FID on the, on the north up. Thank you. Just on the 400, how much will it be for a domestic, uh, let's say, uh, sales, and how much do you think you can export to Bontang? Um, on the uh, this is uh, a, a number which evolves over over time, but uh, on the entire uh, life of the field, the uh, domestic component uh, will be in the region of uh, twenty five thirty percent. Understood. Thank you very much. The next question is from Giacomo Romeo with Jeffries. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, two questions for me. Uh, the first one, uh, Francesco, is on distributions. Uh, your uh, <clears throat> two billion uh, uh, that you got to today—that's uh, uh, on ahead of your uh, uh, CFFO distribution range. Uh, just trying to understand how to think about these in the context of your uh, now lower, moving to a lower level of uh, leverage. Do you think that? Uh, this upper level is uh, what is effectively sustainable in, in the current, uh, um, with the context of the current uh, pro forma leverage. Uh, the second is on uh, chemicals. I'm just uh, trying to reconcile the uh, billion capex that you announced uh, uh, at the CMD, that was for the 24 27 period, with the 2 billion that you now have uh, for the five years. Uh, do you think that uh, you're just going to need a more investment to get to that free cash flow break-even level? Is it a timing issue? And when is the, the when do you think is the right time to bring in the partner uh, in these assets? Thank you. Okay, on um, on the distribution, uh, yes, uh, is correct that uh, clearly we are above the 35% limit. Uh, if you remember, we uh, we came through to this number through different steps. So the first step was uh, uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the first quarter, once there was uh, uh, an expectation, a revision, in particular on scenario, that uh, raised uh, the amount of cash flow we were expecting for this year, and we shared, uh, according with what we have already announced in our distribution policy, the 60%, the 60% of, uh, let's say, upside. And this has brought uh, our distribution for one, so the buyback uh, part of the distribution from 1.1 to 1.6. Then in, uh, in, uh, in July, we announced that uh, taking into account of the uh, highly uh, acceleration, uh, the high acceleration uh, and the uh, materiality of the disposal plan, uh, we were uh, able to consider to uh, bring uh, that uh, uh, percentage of distribution of the cash flow that was originally the 32% applied to the cash flow for operation generated with the scenario we assume in the second uh, in the second forecast uh, at up to the limit of 35%. This has, uh, let's say, is a, a, a brought the potential di additional distribution to an, a, a more an additional 500 million. So the 1.6 could have been raised up to 2.1. We decided to distribute to reach the 2 billion that we announced today. That is equivalent now to 
a revised cash flow from variation because of the scenario to something in the range of 37, 38%. This uh, percentage could be, let's say, sustainable in the future. Clearly, is part of a discussion we will see next uh, next year with the new plan. Uh, so, taking into account all the various elements that will, uh, let's say, characterize the new plan, the scenario, the capex, uh, the activity, the portfolio, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, on a on a general rule, the idea is that. Uh, we want to reinforce the company. The company will be reinforced by growing, diversifying its business, uh, maturing new uh, business lines and uh, uh, enhancing or, imp- or uh, bringing back to profitability other negative lines. And all this will help to have a larger distribution, a progressive distribution. So I cannot answer you specifically on figures, uh, but I can answer you on a qualitative term and the principle that will drive our distribution policy. And now, Adriano, for the other question on chemicals. Yes, uh, thanks, Giacomo, again for the question. Uh, So let let me go back uh, to March when uh, we announced the preliminary plan in terms of restructuring of the chemical portfolio. At the time, uh, we had an outlook for the market, and based on the outlook for the market, we estimate that over the four-year plan, we were in needs of roughly 1 billion euro of investment for the chemical sector in order to transform, so to restructure some piece of the chemical sector, and in order to develop the new platform that are still the same platform that we are talking about today. Um, as uh, Francesco was mentioning during his speech, over since March, we spent a lot of time <coughs> based on the fact that uh, some markets are changed based that in some cases we see more growth compared in some market application than what we see before. In some cases, like uh, I don't want to talk always about automotive, <clears throat> but of course automotive is another piece that uh, in terms of exposure of the chemical sector is also important because in, in the car production goes many different chemical products. So we review completely the entire portfolio in terms of the market and opportunity to grow in the market and where to eventually reduce participation. And we increase uh, um, in some shape or form uh, the area of restructuring of the base chemical portfolio because we strongly believe that the base chemical portfolio in Europe is in a very irreversible situation in terms of economics. So we decided to broad the scope in terms of uh, growth the three platform, but also to develop new platforms like uh, the stationary um, storage battery that we are talking about, and including this uh, new activity, new platform, and also the biorefinery in Priolo, we arrived to estimate the two billion. We are not in the position today to do the breakout of uh, the breakdown of this uh, two billion, but this is how we move from the one billion to the two billion today. That's clear. Thank you. You're welcome. The next question is from Kim Fustier with HSBC. Please go ahead. Hi. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking my questions. I've got two, please. Um, Firstly, could you discuss the significance of the new business structure announced last month? Basically, what does it allow you to achieve um, or achieve differently compared to the previous structure? Secondly, could you give us an update on your plans for the UK North Sea now that the combination with Ithaca has completed? Thank you. Yes, um, about the, uh, the new structure. The new structure is substantially uh, an evolution of the previous one. Uh, you remember that once there was a, uh, the, the previous, it was based on the natural resources and energy evolution. Energy evolution had the scope uh, of uh, creating the platforms that substantially uh, helped to generate, uh, uh, we say, almost uh, f- Four billion of uh, of uh, cash coming uh, from any live and plenty to the um, reduction or or, or or disposal of a, of a minority stake, and uh, clearly that was the opportunity to um, to transform from particularly from the point of view of the biorefinery certain sites, uh, and therefore uh, and therefore having. Uh, a structure of business that could have, uh, let's say, could capture the interest of uh, new investors. So the new structure that is coming is an evolution of that energy evolution original model uh, that has mature in uh, specific on a plenitude and now is moving uh, to having a partner that is uh, clearly a financial partner and uh, as, as a main goal, uh, the road towards an IPO. 
and for this reason, the, the decision was to bring this uh, inside the, um, the CFO uh, structure. On uh, natural resources, it was decided uh, to improve even further the centrality of uh, the uh, technical capability and the trading capability. For this reason, all the engineering activity is uh, centralized under that structure that is now called Global Natural Resource and uh, with the um, trading activity that is entirely inside uh, that uh, responsibility. Finally, uh, transformation, industrial transformation, is uh, clearly now focused uh, on the key dossier of transforming the chemical, creating a, a similar positive uh, uh, evolution that we saw in the refining, uh, in the traditional refining system, and continuing to transform the refining system that clearly has a other activity to be deployed in order to uh, add additional biorefining capacity, and uh, uh, in particular in certain sites, and therefore to reinforce further our uh, any live future business. This is uh, the, uh, the scope and the, we think the advantage of having three structure focalized in different uh, segments of business. About uh, our completion of, uh, of Ithaca, the Ithaca deal, Ithaca is uh, another opportunity. We had uh, a portfolio that was uh, cash generative, but was, uh, let's say, short in terms of opportunity of new project. We think there is a synergies from the operational point of view, but also clearly from the financial and fiscal point of view. And we believe there will be also in this difficult environment still some, uh, let's say, opportunity to grow uh, our uh, oil and gas uh, presence in UK. Clearly for us, UK is becoming a country where we are not just focused on oil and gas, but where we are a major player in CCS and uh, in uh, renewable in the renewable space so for us this is uh, a strategic position on a broader spam of uh, the of uh, of business thank you the next question is from biraj borgataria rbc please go ahead hi thanks for taking my questions um first i'll just follow up on on the uk again um, there's obviously some uncertainty around the tax and the capital allowances um, in the UK. So could you just remind us what the expected CapEx budget uh, for that entity is um, next year and, and whether you can talk to any sort of flexibility you have um, if the rules are you know, more harsh than expected? Um, and then the second question is just on um, going through the statements. It looks like you issued another hybrid, um, which doesn't look like a retender. I think it's a new one. Um, and it, the commentary suggests that it's for FLNG vessels. So just wanted a bit of color on what exactly that was for and, and why you chose that route of uh, financing. Thank you. Uh, on, uh, on the first question, it's very easy. I, I suggest you to, uh, to direct these questions uh, directly to the, uh, to, the Ithaca, uh, to the Ithaca management. Uh, they will present the results and also the plan uh, for the next year is something that is clearly in their uh, responsibility and uh, the disclosure, we cannot anticipate a, a disclosure that is still is uh, difficult for us to present our plan. Uh, speaking about someone else uh, that is doing his job, uh, it's even more difficult. About uh, the hybrid you are referring, this is uh, relating to the floaters LNG. Uh, originally, this is a project that we are, uh, is uh, the Congo LNG project. Remember, that was the two floating LNG. One uh, was, uh, uh, let's say, the smaller scale and the larger scale. One was bought, the other is under construction. And substantially, um, this uh, hybrid uh, was uh, a sort of synthetic uh, financial tool to replicate uh, uh, a leasing uh, model. Originally, with the idea for us was to have uh, uh, um, uh, a floating LNG, so a ship that was uh, under lease. It was uh, the plan that we had once we sanctioned the project was 2022, at the beginning of 2022. Then condition in the market changed. Remember, 2022 was uh, the year where the invasion of, uh, of Ukraine changed a lot of things. And therefore, we had to accelerate and to buy that, uh, that ship. In order to have uh, a model that is substantially replicated from the financial point of view, uh, an installment of payment of, uh, of uh, uh, let's say, a number of years to cover the cost of that ship 
or the capex related to that ship, this is a, the hybrid bond is a solution that is substantially reproducing also in a, from the financial point of view in a better way, in a much more optimal solution, what we designed as the original plan for that uh, ship. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Hyrene Haimona Bernstein. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, c congratulations, first of all, on the, the strategic delivery. Um, I have two questions specific to Q3. Uh, first of all, on cash flows, the cash tax rate increased more than 10% this quarter. Um, I presume this includes more windfall tax installments. Can you say what remains to be paid in Q4, please, and whether that completes the bill or if there is more payable next year. And then secondly, your upstream equity affiliates EBIT uh, increased uh, about 4% sequentially despite the, the weaker oil price. Can you, can you say what is happening there? What drove that strength between Q2 and Q3, please? Thank you. Yes, on the, on the payment related to the windfall tax, uh, we have a uh, last installment on the, of around the 200, uh, 240 million in, the, in November. So that should uh, end uh, the number of payments we did uh, and will substantially reach the level of 2 billion that uh, we paid between 2022 to 2024. So that is the last, uh, the last uh, step. Uh, about the EBIT uh, contribution, I think this is mainly related to the, some of our uh, upstream uh, entities, uh, and uh, we can provide you more detail with the investor relation team. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Matt Smith, Bank of America. Please go ahead. Hey, good afternoon. Um, thanks for taking my questions. Uh, two, please. Um, just firstly, I wanted to come um, back to the buyback. Uh, you've increased it twice this year, quite substantially each time. Um, I mean, given you've built a lot of visibility on balance sheet improvement, I wondered if increased visibility and stability uh, might be an outcome for the buyback as well. And perhaps certainly one way to reduce the complexity in the buyback mechanism might be to offer a recurring stable buyback in euro million terms. I just wanted to test whether that's something that you would see any advantage to or, you know, conversely, are you keen to retain the flexibility um, that a payout ratio gives you? So that'd be my first question. And then my second question actually wanted to turn on to um, European refining, if I could. You know, I appreciate this isn't comparable to Vesalis from an E&I financial perspective, um, but it does seem to be an industry that's facing some structural headwinds as, as well as cyclical ones at the moment. I just wondered if you'd be willing to comment um, your thoughts on the market and whether you think rationalization might also be required in this sector um, to see any sort of tangible improvement in the outlook from here. Thank you. Okay, on, on buyback, uh, clearly, by definition, buyback is a flexible tool. I think that uh, there is not a, a fixed route for buyback. What we think uh, is a, a relatively simple model is that uh, we declare a certain percentage of distribution uh, in, uh, in uh, or a range of distribution in cash flow from operation that is, uh, let's say, clearly split between uh, dividend and buyback. And we say that buyback will improve following uh, additional upside coming from execution uh, or from uh, um, scenario. 60% upside, and on the other side, there is still a possibility, as we did this year, to evaluate with the board the opportunity to, let's say, bring this percentage or evaluating this percentage in a different way than what we did at the original plan, because there is an improvement of. And clearly, we have the floor once we announce, once we announce the uh, let's say, the distribution policy or we upgrade the distribution policy during the year. And so then it is a, a sort of a decision that will be protected from practically all the scenarios through the balance sheet. So this is the model. I think that uh, this is a quite uh, 
attractive model uh, and we do not uh, we cannot have be so deterministic because uh, the life unfortunately cannot be predicted at the at 100 percent and the volatility of the oil market uh, is extremely high i leave now to uh, pino ricci for uh, the answer about the downstream uh, uh, yeah. uh, refining no thank you thank you francesco what we have done on, uh, on refining in the last 10 years was to reduce the exposure of uh, uh, refining on a European market uh, through the creation of uh, the biorefining on one side and the diversification in the Middle East with the RUACE. This strategy allows us not only to create any life with the high value that we have seen today, but also to uh, maintain the, positive, uh, the, the result, positive result uh, in the third quarter of this year with uh, a, a margin very, very low, because today the, our CERM is a one point, was a 1.7 in, uh, in, in third uh, Q24, $10 less than uh, the same quarter of last year. And uh, uh, notwithstanding this, uh, we, uh, we are in a positive, uh, positive region uh, with uh, refining. What we expect in the next uh, months and uh, years for refining uh, uh, margin in Europe, uh, of course, uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, a situation with uh, slightly better than uh, uh, this quarter, but in any case not so so bullish, and uh, that it means that uh, that confirm uh, that uh, our strategy is very correct, and uh, the recent uh, uh, shutdown of Livorno for the transformation in a biorefinery uh, help us to uh, have the further reduction in uh, this exposure. So at this point, uh, we are. Uh, at the minimum capacity of refining, just uh, uh, able to cover uh, the request of the marketing of uh, any live, uh, so, uh, and uh, we are in equilibrium. Uh, in the next years, uh, we will see further, further uh, transformation. But uh, the, the most important thing is that uh, this is a success st story that uh, we have to repeat in the chemistry. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. The next question is from Michele Della Vigna, Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, and uh, congratulations on the strong result and the progress on disposals. Two questions, if I may. The first one is on Egypt. The country clearly is in a deep energy crisis. They are now importing LNG pretty much all year round. I was wondering if there is a lot you can do in terms of extra drilling and exploration to continue to supply more gas as, as you have consistently done in the last few years. And then secondly, I wanted to come back to biofuels, clearly a very successful business you've created there. This year has been tougher in terms of margins. One of the drivers that could tighten the market over the next two, three years could be the implementation of the Red 3 Directive, country by country in Europe. I was wondering if you could give us any visibility of when you think Italy may actually apply the tighter Red 3 standards and therefore raise the renewable diesel demand in Italy. Thank you. Okay. First question is for uh, Guido, uh, and the second one for Stefano Ballista. Um, uh, Thanks for the question. First, uh, I'll, let me let me give you some more um, color on uh, what is the domestic situation, economic situation in in Egypt, which of course we we constantly monitor. So we we see um, positive signals. Uh, there have been uh, material investment uh, deals done recently, uh, and financial support packages have been have been provided by um, essentially mainly from UAE, uh, 35 billion dollars, uh, but also IMF and the EU for 15 billion dollar uh, in total. So it's it's a package of 50 billion dollar, which. Uh, which uh, has, uh, has improved significantly the financial position of the country. But uh, there, there have been also economic reforms uh, made. Um, in March, um, Egypt uh, um, has allowed the uh, local currency to freely float, and, uh, and this has, um, has uh, provided some stabilization on uh, particularly the, the art currency uh, reserves of the, of the country. 
but more importantly, uh, starting in, uh, in August, uh, um, subsidies on uh, electricity have been, uh, have been progressively reduced, uh, and also subsidies on uh, automotive fuel have been, uh, have been uh, um, reduced, so enhancing further the financial position of the country. And, and, uh, um, and recently, the new cabinet announced uh, uh, further structural reform to, uh, to provide uh, <clears throat> a better perspective to the, to the country. Coming to uh, ZOR and the gas production, uh, clearly, um, you know, the uh, overall uh, situation of the country uh, wasn't good till uh, six, uh, nine months ago. So, uh, most of the international operator uh, reduced completely the, the activity, and this resulted in a severe drop in the in the in the production. Now, <clears throat> with um, with uh, with this improved the situation, with uh, the country uh, providing uh, uh, more uh, uh, reliable payment. Uh, paying the mature dues and recovering the outstanding payment activity uh, is restarting. And as far as ENI concern, we have uh, <clears throat> several production optimization activity uh, being foreseen and being implemented uh, in, in most of our field, onshore and offshore. And uh, particularly for, for ZOR, we are envisaging um, a rig coming uh, at the end of the year to start activity beginning of, of next year uh, to, restore, <clears throat> to restore some production over there. Lista for the... Yes, uh, Michele, thank you for the question. Uh, as you said, uh, uh, right now, actually, the third quarter uh, um, experienced uh, uh, the lowest uh, margin ever seen before. Reason is uh, the uh, supply demand and balance. Uh, but actually, as you mentioned, there are clear uh, mandates and regulation uh, coming in place uh, with decision already taken. Uh, Red 3, the Renewable Energy Directive number 3, is one of that. Uh, and you have to look at that in a wider context of other supporting uh, uh, mandates. Focusing on the Renewable Energy Directive number 3, it's going to get uh, uh, defined the growing path in terms of uh, GAG reduction starting from middle of next year. What I would expect is to set new target uh, starting from 2026. And this is going to be true for Italy and for other countries. Then the path in order to get from, uh, just to remind some number, from 14% that is current renewable energy directive up to 29 is going to be probably a quite linear phase uh, in uh, along the years. Another element that I want to highlight in any case is that even now we already know that next year, focusing on Italy, uh, the target, the GAG, the, the energy content target, has been already increased by about 1%. This year is 10.8%. Next year is going to be 11.7%. This is coming from the current Renewable Energy Directive that is keeping its own path. So it's going to be an add-on on top of the increasing target we already are experiencing. experiencing. On top, uh, we have uh, an already defined mandate on pure HVO, so 100% HVO. That one is going to increase uh, by 100k ton next year in Italy. And there is a already uh, defined and approved path in order to reach a million ton with, an, with a step uh, up by 100k ton per year in the following years. So actually, uh, an increased path, the money increased path is already in, uh, in place. Thank you. The next question is from Peter Lowe, Redburn Atlantic. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, another one on, on the KKR deal for the stake in any live. Um, the valuation you achieved um, was really quite impressive given what's going on in the market. Can you perhaps talk a bit about what makes any live unique or particularly well positioned um, in in the biofuel market, and, and kind of have what, what kind of why KKR was willing to kind of pay such such, such a level? 
Um, and, and then um, just separately uh, on organic capex, you're now saying that's going to be kind of below nine billion euros this year. Um, what are the moving parts there that means that's coming in lower than you had initially expected? Thanks. About the evaluation of uh, any life, I think that uh, uh, the competitive advantage or the structure that we design and substantially give to any live uh, a quite uh, compelling uh, investment case uh, uh, rationale because it give you exposure to the growth business uh, of uh, biofuels uh, with the tightening or regulation, the opening of the SAF markets uh, and all the changes that could emerge from demand point of view, in particular we uh, more and more uh, request of uh, uh, HVO also for shipping or other uses just, just the traditional activity. What is the, uh, the advantage is to mix this growth opportunity together with the stabilize, stabilizing uh, quality of our retail. So you are substantially able to uh, travel uh, in this difficult uh, transformation uh, of the um, transportation model, uh, but you are granted uh, by the fact that there is uh, uh, 1.5 million of clients that are uh, uh, coming to our 5,000 uh, uh, service station, uh, uh, buying uh, uh, fuels, uh, buying uh, goods, uh, uh, looking for additional services, etc. And this is the reason you see the result of uh, of uh, any life much more stable, even in a difficult uh, market environment, uh, than other competitors. So I think that this is where the difference is. Uh, and the fact that substantially you can grow, let's say, with a protection that allow you in any case to have other element, element that generate cash. So another factor that uh, you not only have uh, a sort of uh, hedging through this uh, retail, uh, uh, retail contribution, but also to have a cash availability that will help you to have uh, uh, capability to fund your investment and also to have a certain distribution potential in your hands. I believe this is uh, the real, uh, uh, let's say, reason for uh, having such a level of evaluation. About CAPEX, uh, the fact that clearly we are improving uh, uh, on a yearly basis the expectation, uh, there is a step up in the last quarter that is generally an, a natural uh, process uh, following the uh, evaluation of FIDs uh, during the uh, during the year, and you have down payment once you take FID. I think this is a normal uh, and uh, historical uh, trend that you could uh, you could see clearly. We said that we uh, we will be around nine, below nine. It could be something that clearly show uh, in any case an improvement versus the expectation that we had uh, once we announced the capital market day. Thank you. The next question is from Massimo Bonisoli, Equita. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Two questions, please. Uh, one on Versalis. Uh, to better understand the capital discipline, can you provide at least some qualitative indication on the $2 billion spending for the restructuring of Versalis? Roughly how much is related to all plans and how much is driven by growth project? Uh, and if you can be also more specific on new volumes coming from biochemistry and circular economy. And the second question on disposal, um, could you please provide more details on the progress of the eventual disposal of a minority stake uh, of new satellites like uh, CCS as well as uh, biogas? Thank you. Adriano, if you want to answer about the... Sure. <clears throat> Massimo, that said, uh, as I said before, that we don't give uh, the, the split of the two billion uh, euro in terms of investment, how much it is for one compared to another one. But let me give uh, some flavor about uh, um, how, we, how it's going to change our portfolio, just to give you an idea, okay? So if you look historically in terms of traditional business, uh, what you define traditional business, or let's say the four state business, we used to spend uh, more than 50% of our capex on yearly pays uh, for traditional business. So let's say for base chemical and for polymer, uh, commodity polymer, okay? And um, if you look in terms of uh, projection, uh, in terms of portfolio shifting, what we are going to invest uh, for in terms of percentage, 
uh, for base uh, ch uh, chemical and the standard polymer is in the range of 10 percent while 90 percent of the fusion investment uh, on a capex base uh, will be for the new platforms okay of chemical platform if you look in term of the second part of your question how much we are going to grow Today, the portfolio of Versalis, uh, based on two, the average 2023-2024, is 30% uh, on uh, specialties, where this specialty include uh, the compounding business, uh, the biochemistry, circularity, and so on. And the other 70% is uh, base, uh, chemical, and the standard polymer. After the transformation, so in five, year of, in five years from now, based on our transformation program, so restructuring program, and develop of new platforms, we expect to go to 65% of the specialty business. And in this 65% is, of course, included the, the bio piece. Yeah. Okay, about the disposal plan, uh, I, clearly you know, we have already, let's say, uh, announced that we are uh, in a, currently in a, tendering activity with uh, received uh, interest from five, six uh, in potential investors for the CCS. Uh, this is a process that we require also sometimes uh, fine-tuning, uh, but clearly there is uh, an interest from different operators uh, to, to join us uh, in a portfolio that is, uh, uh, let's say, spreading from UK, Italy, uh, Netherlands, uh, Nor Norway, and other countries, and that become, uh, will become uh, one of the major levers for the decarbonization of hard to abate industries. Um, we are continually working on uh, uh, on the, the dual exposure model. So there is uh, uh, some uh, assets uh, that are uh, uh, under negotiation because clearly we are in a more advanced stage for that uh, specific uh, field. So clearly we we are referring to some of the last uh, most relevant discoveries. And uh, we are clearly also working on certain additional uh, uh, activity of, uh, of uh, um, valoriza valorizing uh, again some stakes in plenitude uh, and also potentially a novel member. This will could take more time. So, have you seen? As you seen uh, in the past month, uh, the, we are a very active portfolio uh, activity and. Uh, I think that we are uh, able to deliver uh, on a very fast way and uh, in a very effective uh, in terms of value uh, valorization uh, our uh, our plan of disposal. This is what I can tell you for the time being. Thank you. The next question is from Lydia Rainford Barclays. Please go ahead. Thank you, and good afternoon. Um, two questions, please. And the first one, uh, just going back to the satellite plan, I think there was some talk in the press about the idea of carbon capture of the CCS side um, going into that satellite model. Can you just talk us through what you're seeing on CCS at the moment? And then secondly, on Azul, can you just remind us when the drilling in Namibia, um, when we should actually think about that coming through as well? Thanks. On CCS, uh, uh, what is... Uh, what is now evident is, is after uh, a number of years where there were some, uh, let's say, skepticism about the potentiality of this uh, of this industry that is uh, a quite traditional industry. It's nothing particularly new. What is uh, what is new is substantially to link to the, together emitters uh, and uh, storage potential. This is the the chain that was never tested, but uh, injecting CO2 in a reservoir is a quite traditional and used uh, activity. Uh, we uh, we see there is a huge interest. There is a huge interest because uh, uh, there are targets uh, from a lot of industry to decarbonize their uh, their uh, production line, and uh, and you have uh, we have the uh, the storage potential. So we can uh, we can deploy our expertise, our know-how. We can keep uh, the cost of that activity. Uh, as cheap as possible because we are using uh, existing facilities. Uh, we are injecting uh, in depleted reservoirs and not in aquifers, so the cost of uh, energy related to that uh, activity is, uh, is, uh, is, is lighter. And uh, in the countries where there is a, a regulation uh, uh, framework uh, already defined, uh, there is the potential to take FID in a relatively short term. You have seen that the UK has allocated uh, 
a budget for this activity to support uh, the uh, the players uh, uh, that uh, will be involved, so the meters uh, and on the other side uh, the uh, injectors. And uh, we are uh, already testing, or we are already, let's say, as we mentioned also during the presentation, uh, completed the first part of our project in Ravenna with a capture of more than 90%, or up to 96% as a peak of a stream of CO2 that is uh, uh, less than 3% in thermal concentration, so it's more difficult to capture. So it proves that this technology could be extremely effective in minimizing emissions. And therefore, this is a business with a great potential. Uh, we need just uh, to be, let's say, patient in understanding that uh, not only the players but also the government have to be ready for uh, uh, having this business uh, as, a, as an option uh, in the table. Uh, the other question is about uh, Azul, the Namibia, I think Guido. Oh, thank you. Um, on, uh, on Namibia, um, I mean, the the activity. Uh, I mean, we are we are planning to spot. I mean, Azul is planning to spot uh, uh, two wells um, in the PEL85 uh, uh, block, which is uh, close to some of the largest discovery made in uh, in Namibia. Um, we are quite optimistic on uh, on those uh, on those wells, and um, the rig is. Uh, <clears throat> is planned to move uh, uh, by the end of the year so uh, we'll likely spot the first well in uh, december uh, our, um, those wells are um, not so i mean in terms of duration is uh, months and a half two months maximum so we'll we'll have first result of the first well by q1 and uh, and the second and the second well uh, either late in q1 or uh, Guido? Yeah. Uh, no, okay, there was yeah, uh, no. probably, the, uh, uh, let's say, the line was interrupted. I think that you say late in oh. Q1 or, or early Q2. I yeah, would the suppose. first, uh, first, uh, <laughs> first well uh, uh, will be mid Q1, the result, and uh, that the second well we expect by uh, late Q1 or early, or early Q2. Thank you. The next question is from Henry Tarr, Berenberg. Please go ahead. Um, hi there, and thanks for taking my uh, questions. <clears throat> um, two, two, if I may. Um, one, just on uh, CapEx. Uh, the run rate clearly is sort of well below now the, the $9 billion, um, that you indicated. I just wonder, um, has anything been deferred? Or you know, how, is, um, how have you sort of or shuffled out, um, just uh, how has this CapEx uh, number moved? And then, and then secondly, just coming back to the sort of biorefining outlook, you're clearly sort of building uh, new facilities, um, you know, three new facilities now, I think. Um, the, the market today is is oversupplied. I mean, how confident sort of are you? You know, I know there's red three, et cetera, but as you look out, when, when do you think this market comes back into balance? Because I, I guess we're already seeing some projects get cancelled or, or, or delayed due to the current challenges. Thanks. Okay, on CAPES, uh, there is no, let's say, uh, 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 delayed uh, investment. It's just a matter of maturation of FID that comes uh, at the end of the year. I, you mentioned also the fact that clearly that we take FID in biorefineries. We will have some FID also in upstream. Uh, additional activity also sometimes uh, in, uh, in the exploration activity. So a lot of things that normally occur uh, in, the, in the last quarter. On uh, uh, the biorefining uh, outlook, I leave uh, back to Stefano Ballista. Yeah, thank, no, thank you for the question. No, you're absolutely right. The, the, sh the short term, uh, the current scenario, as, as I said before, uh, it's, uh, I would say we, we have ever seen uh, uh, this kind of level. But actually, on the other side, it's definitely clear that the medium uh, scenario is uh, well defined. Uh, regulation are, as I said before, are in place. So uh, there is no uh, debate on that. Uh, the red three it's going to double current uh, growth path, and it's uh, not uh, yet in place. It will get in place starting uh, 
2026, let me say. Uh, SAF is more than a million ton, re refuel aviation on SAF is going to be more than a million ton, and this is going to get in place uh, following year. Uh, another example, uh, looking at current uh, decision at country level, we got Germany that actually banned the UER as a lever to uh, comply with mandatory, with, with um, blending mandates, and at the same time they stopped the carryover of, of certificate uh, from 2024 to the following, to the following years. This is going to give, uh, starting from next year, an upside of uh, above uh, 600 k ton. Same reasonment we could do on, on U.S. Uh, the LCFS uh, for California uh, is expected uh, end of this year, beginning of the following, is going to do an increase from 20% to 30% in terms of GAG reduction, with a step up, uh, current estimate, expectation actually is about 7% as a step up starting from following year. And then we are starting to see a lot of... Uh, uh, tax credit support on SAF. Uh, uh, this year, SAF, of course, in, in Europe is just a voluntary demand. In US, we are, we are starting to see some uh, demand driven also by, uh, let me say, um, supporting incentives in terms of tax credit. I want to mention Washington, where you're going to get a specific tax credit on SAF. And that's why we are seeing some demand over there. Given this kind of trajectory, we see 2020, 30, uh, above 50 million ton of demand and this is absolutely overtaking supply. Thank you very much. The next question is from Martin Ratz with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Martin? Mark. Oh, probably drop the line. Martin Ratz, your line is open. Let's move to the next one. The next question is from Paul Reedman, BNP Paribas. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, guys, and thank you very much for your time. Um, just a quick question on IPOs. You mentioned, I think, $2.5 billion of cash inflow next year from divestments, possibly. Does that include a plenitude IPO? And then when we think about IPOs for ENI Live, KKR seems to be paying a significantly higher multiple for ENI Live than maybe where some of your listed peers trade. Why would that not mean that you just focus on increasing partner stakes? I think you've said before that ENI would like to hold, say, 60% stake in ENI Live, so there's a lot more room to go for partner sales. Um, and then just quickly, following on from ENI Live, a question on voluntary demand for sustainable aviation fuel next year. Um, what are you guys expecting? Thank you. Uh, on the IPOs, uh, clearly in that amount that I mentioned, I was mainly referring to the negotiations that are still ongoing and that will be, we expect to close within the end of the year. So that 2.4 is substantially, uh, uh, let's say, a bunch of assets uh, and do not include uh, any IPO. IPO is difficult to be predicted, it's related to a lot of things. Uh, mainly on the financial stability and market condition. You know very well that in Europe this year still, after 2022 and 2023, is an year of a very, let's say, limited number of IPOs. Um, you are right that there is a very attractive multiple in the evaluation that we received so far. Uh, in, the, uh, in selling down our stake, the logic for us is uh, to have a balance between uh, expectation of an IPO in the middle long term and having valorization up front. The valorization front is high, but uh, is based also on the expectation of business that will uh, double their EBITDA, uh, plenitude within the four-year plan, uh, and in live uh, just a bit longer. But uh, substantially, this is uh, the, uh, the time period that, that, that could the risk uh, an IPO, take into account of uh, the multiple that you are seeing in the market. So this is uh, substantially what we believe, and we do not uh, think that uh, the solution towards an IPO is to have a continuous uh, sell down of a stake, because at the end of the day, you are substantially doing an IPO <laughs> uh, to the end of someone else, then, uh, and you do not control then when you will be able to do an IPO if you continue to reduce uh, your stake, while we want to, to keep uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, decision uh, in our hands. About the SAF uh, demands, uh, Stefano Ballista will answer, please. 
Yes, uh, thanks for the question. On, on SAF demand, uh, in Europe next year we expect above a million ton. Uh, common, this is not voluntary demand, this is uh, mandatory demand, so there is no option but to be compliant with that. So this is a given. Uh, we see voluntary demand in US, we expect doubling this year voluntary demand. Uh, it's voluntary, but as, as I said, linked to uh, tax uh, credit uh, dedicated to SAF, uh, and we expect about a million ton, uh, twice as much uh, current year. So overall above two million ton. Thank you. Okay, we take the last, the last question, please. The last question is from Matt Lofting, JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking the questions. Um, two, please. Uh, first, I just wanted to come back on the distribution policy. Um, Francesca, you, you talked earlier through the sort of the, the steps that, that, that E and I have taken through this year in, in ending up at the sort of the, the two billion buyback, which is a, a, a very strong and welcome number. It, it just strikes me that in the end, the sort of the, the, the cash flow expectation for, for 2024 now is very similar to what you expected in, in March, and, and yet the buyback is is nearly double at 1.1 to 2. So could you perhaps just talk more conceptually about how we should think about that? Is 2024 to some degree exceptional or specific in the context of the, the, the progress and the momentum around the, the strategy and deleveraging the balance sheet? Or when we think forward to 2025 and, and beyond, should, should we systematically expect that, that you that you begin the year by setting a sort of a floor in terms of the buyback, which inherently is then a more conservative level, and then looking to grow it as you move through the year, dependent on macro and dependent on performance? And then the second quicker question was um, Italy taxes. Uh, there's been various different reports of moving parts it's, it's in, since the summer. Uh, and perhaps you could just update us on your understanding there. Thank you. Okay, on this, uh, the taxes, the windfall tax, uh, clearly now is uh, is clear what is the announcement. So I think that it's not involving clearly the energy system. It's involving different sectors. Uh, so I think there is no other uh, speculations around the potential uh, taxes. About the... Um, uh, the buyback that you are referring, the doubling substantial of the buyback, uh, is uh, exactly the point that you are referring. Uh, referring. At the beginning of the year, we are expecting uh, to have a leverage uh, between 20 to 25 percent, uh, and uh, we are doing much better. The number of uh, disposal, the amount of disposal that we are assuming uh, this year uh, are substantially including the one that uh, we expect to, to, let's say, to announce, to close in terms of negotiation in the coming quarter uh, are much above our expectation. Uh, completing almost 80-90% of your disposal plan uh, in, uh, in 12 months, uh, clearly not cashing in everything uh, in, uh, in 12 months, but having this, uh, this uh, activity substantially de-risked entirely make a lot of difference uh, in, the, in the perception of your distribution policy and your balance sheet strength. Uh, in the, your question about this is a model that potentially could happen uh, in the coming years, I believe in the logic of the buyback that we presented, that the answer should be yes. What we said, once we announced the buyback or the distribution policy, we substantially set a floor. So by definition, you will see an improvement. Clearly, it depends that there is an improvement during the year. Uh, but uh, an improvement, an implicit improvement the buyback, if you are able to show that uh, from the uh, point of view of price and scenario, execution of your strategy or portfolio, you see that uh, the, the quarters uh, uh, comes better than you what you expected in February or March once you started uh, your, uh, your uh, yearly performance. This is, uh, in, uh, let's say, by definition, uh, what is happening uh, this year. Uh, also, what happened, uh, I think, one or two years ago, we did the same. Uh, I think this is uh, the complete the, the, the today's session. I believe that was a, a quite a dense, uh, let's say, uh, day with a lot of uh, questions. And thank you all for the attendance. Our team of investor relations clearly is always available. Also during the weekend, John is uh, said that it's completely free. So we can, uh, uh, let's say, ask you to call him and uh, the... Uh, his team uh, for uh, having all the data or information that we 
we have not covered during this call. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining. The conference is now over. You may disconnect your telephones.